Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to be getting started in about a minute or two. I still see people coming in and joining this webinar. Um, while you're waiting, this is a great opportunity to set up your workstation. Make sure that you have your supplies for the art activity that we'll be doing today. Um, and if you're already set up and ready to go, what you can do is look at two of the artworks that we have here. And we'd love to hear in the chat what you see um, and what questions that you might have and what it makes you wonder and sharing that with us. Um, and if you wanna know some idea of materials, Laura has shared that in the chat. So look there if you wanna get some ideas for um, types of materials that you want to have for your art activity today. Um, we also have a tip for a lot of you. Um, if you want to show off your creation, so at the end of the webinar, we're going to be inviting people to email a photo of their artwork and we'll be showing it to everyone who's been a part of the workshop. So the email address is in the chat um, and make sure that you have your cameras ready um, so you can take a picture and send it to Laura, um, who's here joining us, and she has the email in the chat. Um, so make sure to look there. I see that we have a lot of people here. Um, so if you have everything ready, um, just take a moment and share it with us, either in the chat or the Q&A, what you see or what these different artworks make you wonder, what questions you have for them. And then we'll get started in about one minute. So um, I do see one question, and I think this one is for Ellen. Um, someone was curious um, on what was on that piece, the, the artwork on the left. It, what is it like pictures or they're curious of what it might be. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Ellen. Um, so that is um, a piece of bone and it's um, and I will talk about it more during the session, but what you're looking at are um, carvings or inscriptions of pictures and it's very early, um, it's the very first writing in China. And we'll tell, learn lots more about it later on. Perfect. And one more question, I think before we move on and get started, um, was about the artwork on the right. And they were curious, they thought it was made, they, there were, they wondered if it was a dinosaur or something like that. So they're kind of curious about what it is um, and why it's in an art museum. That's a really good question. And that's also something we'll talk about later, but you're getting very close in that it's fossils like the dinosaurs that we see in museums. Um, but I'll tell you more specifically about what it is and why it's in an art museum in just a little bit. So excellent question. Yeah. Someone has a guess that it might be an elephant. So we'll see if that's right as we go forward. So I think we're ready for the next slide and to get started. Um, so welcome um, to this Art and Me workshop on preservation. Um, we're gonna be talking about different bones today and artworks that um, are in our collections, both at the National Museum of Asian Art, as well as the Smithsonian's American Art Museum. And we're going to be talking with some of our conservators and how they protect artworks with bones. As I said earlier, my name is Matthew Lesnowski, and I work in the communications and education department at the Smithsonian's Freer and Sackler Galleries. And I'm joined with some colleagues here. So I'm going to let Ellen, who also works with me at the National Museum of Asian Art, um, to introduce herself. Hi everyone, um, I'm Ellen Chase and as Matthew said I work with him at the National Museum of Asian Art and I am the objects conservator there and we'll talk a little bit more about what that might be but um, I'm going to pass you on to Leah who is also an objects conservator and she's going to tell you about herself a little bit too. Hi everybody, my name is Leah Bright and like Ellen said I'm also an objects conservator so I take care of the sculptures and the three-dimensional artworks in our collection. And, um, oh, I'm at the Smithsonian American Art Museum that we like to call SAM. And then I think next up is Laura, who's also at SAM. Thanks, Leah. I'm Laura Hoffman, and I am the program manager at the Lunder Conservation Center, as Leah said, at SAM or Smithsonian, 
Smithsonian American Art Museum. So I work on programs and I get to work with all of the conservators. All right, let's go on to our next slide. All right, so Leah and I have just been talking a little bit about how we're conservators and we're just wondering if anybody knows what a conservator is. Have you ever heard that word before? Um, and maybe if you haven't, if you have a guess, what do you, what do you think it is that we might do in the museum? So while you're thinking about that, I can sort of tell you a little bit. Um, one of the things that we do um, is that we try and preserve all of the artworks in the collection. We try and keep it safe. And then if something happens, we try um, to make it better and fix it. Right. So Iris just said they fix things. That's right. We do. So if you think about it, we're a lot like doctors for artwork. Because just like when you go to the doctor, you go there for a checkup to make sure everything's OK. We do the same thing for the art. And if you're not feeling well, if there's something wrong, the doctor tries to help you feel better and help you fix things. Right. So we're we're basically like art doctors. Um, and we have uh, special things that we wear. So like if you can see, I'm wearing a lab coat. Um, I wear a lab coat for two reasons. Um, and try and think about when you go to the doctor, sometimes doctors wear lab coats too. And why do you think, what, what is the reason why doctors would wear a lab coat? Um, so one of the things would be to protect me from stuff that I'm working on, right? So that I don't get dirty. So like if you look at my sleeves, you can see Sometimes I get dirty when I'm using paint and that's one of the reasons I wear a lab coat. But I also wear the lab coat to try and keep the artwork safe because if I'm wearing something like a fuzzy sweater or anything like that, I don't wanna get that on the art. So it serves two purposes. And then if you look in the picture, you can see that the conservators in the picture are wearing something special too that you don't wear all the time. I'm wondering, can you guys take a look at the picture and see if you see anything that those conservators are wearing that, um, that, they, that are special things that they're wearing to to work. Take a look at their hands, see if you see anything special or different about what they're doing or what they're wearing. Um, Iris wrote badges. Right, they are wearing badges. We wear badges just especially in the gallery so that, that people know and the security officers know that we are supposed to be there. Um, and then um, also gloves, right, 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 right. So, so we wear gloves because there are oils on everybody's hands and you wear gloves to make sure that you um, don't get any of the oil on the artwork. Even if you wash your hands, we, and we wash our hands all the time, but there's still stuff on there that can damage artwork. Um, and then I noticed someone said in the chat they couldn't see me in my lab coat. If I'm talking, can you see me? Can you see the lab coat? Um, if not, we'll turn this, the, the slideshow will get turned off later and you'll be able to see it. Um, but for now, um, Let's move forward a little bit and talk about some of the other things. So, so when you guys are working on your projects, we'll talk more about tools, but this just gives you an idea. This is um, my desk in the middle of a very busy project and you can see all kinds of different tools that I have to be working on um, artwork. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, but for now I'm gonna pass it off to Laura, who's gonna get you guys started. Thanks, Ellen. Yes. And as Ellen mentioned, we will have time where we're going to take off the slideshow. So we have some other tools that we'll be able to share and they'll be larger. But for right now, we want to get your hands busy. So please take out your carving material. You can have either a bar of soap or modeling clay or honestly anything that you feel comfortable carving into. A soft material is going to be best. And then I have some tools with me that I'm going to use. Again, you can use what you have. Um, I like to use either a pencil or some sort of wooden stick. This is actually uh, often used by conservators to wrap cotton around. So they use it as a cleaning tool, like a cotton swab, but I just took off the cotton and because it's got a very dull point here, which is good. I also have some child safe pumpkin carving tools, which can be good. And then, you know, not a likely carving tool, but very effective for this activity, a paper clip. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna think about what I want to create here. And I'm gonna start with a basic design. So I'm going to take, you can either do it with the point of a pencil or again, a wooden stick. And I'm just going to draw here some 
some lines here of the basic design, just an outline here. So you can see I started to do some curves right here. So I can start to use that as a guide to cut away. Then I'm gonna to start to carve these sides here. So I'm just gonna take off big chunks. And again, I'm using this child safe tool, but also if you want some smaller ones, you can see how effective I'm just using the paper clip takes off this nice little point there. So you start to carve away. And once you have your basic shape, you can see then it's still pretty flat here, right? So I'm gonna carve away at the sides and really round it out. So as you keep working, you can keep working on it and to take little by little. That's why we suggested too, if you're using soap, you might wanna have like a, a toothbrush, not one that you actively use because it can have some shaving. So, you know, you might wanna be able to brush those away and a toothbrush can be very helpful. Um, Laura, mm -hmm. I think some people don't have their settings set up so that they can see oh. it. So I don't know if you want to, for this part, just get rid of the PowerPoint. I so sure can. Let me stop sharing for a second. Thank you. So again, I already started carving here, but again, once you draw an outline and you kind of impress it in to show you where to go, then what you can do is use some of your tools. So this is here, this is my pumpkin carving tool here, but a very dull one. And I start to take off these chunks. And I also like to use this little paper clip here. And I can take off an even smaller one. So if I want to create a fun little shape within that, and you can also use this to take off sides too. Oops, or you can just break your little stick. You can see it depending on which material, some of it's stronger than others. Um, one part that I did like to notice here, and I, I took it off, is you just keep shaving away little by little. And you also want to think about the surface. So once you carve away your basic shape, you want to think about what do you want on the surface, this top part here? Do you want to create some interesting textures or do you want to leave it very smooth? You might want to take, again, your little popsicle stick or skewer and make a little designs on here as Ellen and as Leah will be showing some examples of different things that you can put on your surface here. You could create little lines. So just think about it as you start working. And we wanted to give you lots of time to work on this. So please continue working. We're gonna give you two examples, one from for your Sackler and one from Sam. And at the end of this, we want you to take a picture. So as you're working, have your caretaker take a picture of your artwork and you're gonna email it over to dwrclunder at si.edu. I put it in the chat and I'll put it in again. And at the end of this, we'll get to see your creations. So I'm gonna go back to sharing here. So give me one quick second. And one thing that we, so we've done this workshop once before and some people just shared a progress shot of their artwork. So if you're not 100% done, it's okay to share your artwork and we'd love to see what progress you've made. That's a really good point. A few participants after the workshop will email us a final one. And that's great too, because we're gonna show you, we have a, a learning lab with all the resources. So if you wanna share it for that learning lab, there'll be ample opportunity for you to do that. Okay, so let's keep going as you are working. And Leah, would you like to share some source of inspiration for us? I would. All right. So as you can see, this is that same photo that we looked at initially at the very beginning. And this is a really fun piece that combines art and science. So does anyone, I know someone said they thought maybe it was a dinosaur or an elephant. What else do you see? Does anyone else have other ideas about what we could be looking at? It's possible there's some hints on the screen there. <laughs> um, but take a second and look closely at what you see. Yes, yeah, so Jay said mammoth. Oh, and Carrie said woolly mammoth. Excellent. Anything else? 
Let's see, I think on the next slide, we have a bit of an answer for you. Oh, yes. And Sherling said Mastodon. Perfect timing for that answer. So as you can see here on your left, this is what scientists think that that animal looked like when it was alive about 10,000 years ago. Um, and it is a mastodon, which is related to mammoths, but they look a little bit different. They're not as hairy as you can see, and it kind of does look like an elephant. Um, so the one that is in the museum was dug up in the state of New York about 200 years ago. And at that time, it was the largest land animal that anyone had ever known about. And it was dug up by someone named Charles Wilson Peel, who was a famous painter. And he was friends with people like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. And eventually that skeleton ended up in Germany. In Germany. And this is the first time that it's back in the United States since it left. And what do you think they're doing on the right? What is going on there? There's a bunch of different people and it looks like they're in our museum. What do you think is happening there? Someone wrote in Leah that thought that they might be putting it together. Yes, yes, Jay, good job. So luckily nothing had really happened to it at this point. This was all the different people that were needed to help put it up in the museum. So it came to the museum in a bunch of different crates in a bunch of boxes. And these are some of the people that are help putting all those bones together on display for you to see them in the museum. But they're not actually all bone. It's not all fossilized bone. When it was dug up out of the ground, a lot of the bones were missing. So Mr. Peel actually hired a sculptor to make those missing bones out of wood. And so that's why this is a particularly fun project, both for scientists who study animals and for art conservators like me, because it's part animal and also part sculpture. And so this is a picture of me and some of the other conservators taking photos of the mastodon. Um, so we can know more about which parts are carved wood and which parts are fossilized bone. And here's kind of a crazy photo. Is there, what do you notice? What is happening in this picture? Are there any different colors that you see? Are some parts different than others? I see some people typing. Um, and someone noticed that some of the parts are blue and some of the parts are like a brown color. Yes, that is exactly right. So if you can see its head and those big long tusks, those look brown. And then most of the other bones look bright blue. And there's some, there's a little bit of difference between those blue colors. Some look much brighter and more white and some look darker and not as bright. And the really bright white ones are actual bone. But the darker colors, oh wow, Jay, you are just so on top of it. The blue might be real bones with the brown might be fake. Yes, you are spot on. So the top of the head and those tusks are parts that were missing when it was dug up out of the ground. So those were made out of wood and plaster. And some of the ribs are actually also made out of wood. And some of the leg parts actually as well. So it's kind of hard to tell some of those differences, but yeah, you're exactly right. Um, and the next photo, these are some details, some close-ups of those wood carvings. So on the um, legs and on the ribs. So this is a great place to get some inspiration for your own carvings. On the left there, you can see those little dots and those are actually from the wood carver's tools. So think about textures when you're making your sculptures. What kind of textures can you make on your carvings? And there on your right, those are the ribs of the mastodon. And there's some writing on those. And those are numbers. And those are actually original. Those were made after the sculptor carved them. And we think that those were used to help put them together. Um, I think it's really cool that you can see the tool marks and the numbers, the writing from someone who made these over 200 years ago. 
And feel free to put any other questions you have in the chat. And up next, Ellen will show you some more fascinating marks and textures made on bone from the Freer and Sackler galleries. So we have um, a lot of different kinds of objects in the Freer and Sackler, which are made from bone. Um, these are just a few of them. Um, some of them which may look more familiar to you than others, but take a quick look and see if you recognize any of these objects and if you can see what they might be. Some of them are things we might have now or you've seen before, but they may not be made of bone now, but at the time they were made, bone was something that was used. So is there anything you guys see that looks familiar? Um, Jay thought that uh, it might be the tip of an arrow. And right. then Gary said it looks like a comb shovel. And a comb, Iris said too. Right, right, that's right. So that is an arrowhead. So that would be put onto um, the shaft of the arrow. And then yes, on the lower left, that is a comb. Um, and you can see it's old and it's been buried. So some of the teeth are missing and there's some dirt in there, but but yes, exactly. It would be used to comb your hair. Um, and then on the right, the the box that you see, that's mostly lacquer. The, the red and the black is a different material, but the white, the, the images are carved from bone. Um, and then on the upper left, you can see a little piece that would have been a spatula and the whole spatula would have been carved, but I really liked the face that was carved into it. To, and I thought it might be a, give you a good idea of like ways that people can carve the surface of bone. And then learn, yeah, great. So, so when you guys were asking earlier about what was on the bone in the beginning, um, that is something, um, it's one of a number of pieces in our collection. They're, they're known as oracle bones. Um, and so these are some other examples. These are smaller pieces, but what, um, would, what they would be used for, they would be used for rituals where you could either ask a question and hope to get a question answered or um, make a prediction. And so a lot of the time it would be things like weather or you know, a hunting expedition, or is it a good time to, um, to perform a ritual to honor your ancestors, all kinds of different things. Um, and so, the writing, like I was saying, is um, these are over 3,000 years old, all of these pieces. And so the, the writing, it's, it's called a pictograph or a pictogram, and it's very early. And so some of it is pictures, and some of them are characters. And a lot of them develop later on into the characters that are now used in Chinese writing. Um, but some of them are, are very separate, but about, the, about half of them are very similar. And so people can actually read these and understand what they say. Um, and so if you go to the next one, Laura. So this is that first example. And I'm showing you this one because this actually is, it's bigger. They're, they tend to break into small pieces because bones are fragile. Um, but but um, this one, you can, there's actually a whole section that's written. And then it also, you can see on the back, the way that they would um, do the, the question answering or the divination is that they would make little depressions and then heat them and they'd wait and see how the bone would crack. And depending on how the bone cracked, they would then make a prediction. Um, and so we don't really know how they read the bones, just that they went through this process. But, but because then what they would do is they would record what they were asking and the answers. We know in a lot of cases, especially on the bigger pieces, so like this one in particular um, was asking about the weather. So, so it says in the 12th moon on day two, the question is whether it will rain. And it was predicted that it would rain on day 15. And then the answer was that it rained on the fourth day of the month. So maybe not quite right. It did rain, but not the right day. Um, and then on the left side, that's only part of a, a, a question. Sorry, the left side on the um, front one. Um, there's um, a question about animals. And so you can kind of see there is an animal there, but we don't have the whole, um, we don't have that whole part. But it gives you an idea of the different kinds of symbols and ways of carving in um, that the pieces have. Um, and so if you want to go to the next one, Laura. And so to help us see them, sometimes you can see from this slide of the, um, or the picture of the original object, it's sometimes hard to read them. So, so um, we'll go through and, and very carefully try and record all of the different characters to make it a little bit easier to try and read it and understand what's on there. Um, and so this is for you guys. Sometimes you can actually guess or understand by looking at them. Um, even if they're not necessarily similar to a character, but sometimes they're so similar to modern characters that you can see. But if you take a look at some of the ones that are on here, maybe take a look and see if you can guess what, what these symbols might be talking about. What do you think that one on the left that Laura's pointing to might mean? Any ideas? Does it look like something similar? If you were drawing something, what would that look like to you? 
to me, it looks like it might be some sort of animal. Does that, does that make anybody, give anybody some ideas? Someone says they think it looks like it's dancing or moving. And another person, mm -hmm. Iris, says it looks like a mouse. Cool. Well, what it actually, it does kind of look like a mouse, you're right. But what it actually is, it's either, they're not totally sure, it's either talking about a mule or a deer. And um, so that part is talking about, there's another part there that's a number. And so it's talking about 20 deer. Um, but then the other part on the other side is the whole section where they're talking about weather. And then those are some of the cir ones circled in blue or some other ones you might guess relating to weather. So what are some, what are some words that you might use to talk about weather or time of day or anything like that? Raining was something that Hayo Hi said. Right, right, that's right. Three dots, that, that is in fact, that's the character for the rain. And then Laura, if you wanna to go to the next one, you guys can see what all four of them are. Um, so there's the mule and the deer and rain. And then next to rain is sun, which also means day. Um, and then up top, you can kind of see the one that looks like a crescent. It looks a little bit like a moon, so which is what it is, but it also represents month. So you can see how the pictures sometimes connect directly to the words and sometimes they, they um, are easier to figure out than other times. <laughs> So one of the things about um, working with bone is that it can be very fragile. And so for Leah and I, we have to think a lot about what makes it, um, um, what makes it more fragile or how we take care of it to, to try and prevent anything from happening. And so um, bone can be very brittle and fragile and it's very sensitive to changes in the amount of water in the air. Um, so if you think about, like, think about what Washington is like in the summertime, it just feels like there's tons of water in the air, right? And then in the winter time, it feels much drier. And and um, and I don't know about you, but like my hands get really dry in the winter. One because I'm washing them, but two because it's so dry. And so bone, it doesn't like it when it gets really dry. It makes it crack and break. And so if you look at the one on the left, you can see all those cracks. Part of that is because it got too dry at some point. This was before it came to our collection, but it's a good example. So I'm showing it to you. But and and with the oracle bones, because they're already cracked as part of their um, part of their um, use in their culture. It makes them more susceptible, but it's also really important. We wanna keep those cracks in that case because they're part of its use, it's part of its history. So we have to think really hard in that case about how to, how to preserve it, but also um, make sure that no more damage happens. And then sometimes if you look at the piece on the right, sometimes we have old repairs that someone did a long time ago because the bones are so easy to break. And sometimes the repairs are actually causing their own damage and they're hard to undo. So we have to also think about whenever we work on stuff, we try and do things that are easier to take apart if something goes wrong or if we have to redo something. Um, so I think, yeah, no, 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 that's good. Um, so I think for now, these are just a couple of our examples um, and, and I can show you, I did the one on the left, which was kind of inspired by that. You can't, I don't know if you can see in that thing, but I, in, it was inspired by um, the piece of the spatula that I showed you in, in the earlier slide. And then Leah made the awesome cat on the right so she can talk about that. And then- Yes, here's my little sculpture here. Oh, perfect. And so next we're going to talk about the art doctor report, which you all, if you'd like, can, oh, yes, and send us photos of your sculptures. We would love to see them. Um, so an important part of our job is filling out these art doctor reports to make sure that all the artwork is healthy, it's in good condition to make sure it stays that way. So I'll go through this with you guys using my little sculpture here. And so at the top, it says art doctor or conservator's name. So that would be me, Leah. And the art's name, what would you title this? What do you think this sculpture should be called? Any ideas? Let's see, I don't know what the best way for you to see it. There we go. And we see some people typing. Someone wrote Grumpy Cat. <laughs> That's perfect, I love it. This was based off my sister's cat who is in fact a very grumpy cat. So I think, you really got that there. <laughs> so I'm gonna call it Grumpy Cat. And then the examination says, what three words best describe your artwork? 
So someone already said grumpy, but is there any other words that you think would describe this sculpture? Anything like color or maybe the texture? What words describe this carving? Uh, Carrie says cute and Jay oh. says important and Perry agrees with Carrie and says cute. <laughs> oh, thanks everyone. <laughs> I'm glad you think it's cute. Yeah, so cute would be good. Oh, perfect, Clara. White. Yes, it is white. And I don't know if you probably can't see very well, but I tried to make it look fuzzy. I actually used a fork to give it texture. Hopefully it looks fuzzy. So perfect. Those are great words. And the next question says, which emoji best describes how you felt creating the art? And I felt really proud of myself making this carving. So I would probably choose the sunglasses emoji, but I hope you all feel pretty happy making your carvings. And the next question is, what can you do to best care for your art? And if this was real bone, just like Ellen said at the beginning, you would want to make sure that your hands are either wearing gloves or that they're very clean because bone can stain and anything that's on your hands could stain bone. And she also talked about the amount of water in the air. So if this was a bone sculpture, we would want to make sure, we would want to try our best to make sure that it's in an environment that doesn't have too much water in the air or too little. And I would probably also want to keep this out of direct sunlight because bright sunlight, just like our skin, artwork can get damaged by the sun. So those are pretty important. And at the bottom is a place for you to sketch and draw your own carvings and your own artwork that you've created. And that can help us monitor over time any changes or issues that are going on with your sculpture. And so I hope that makes sense. Let us know if you have any questions about the art doctor report. And most importantly, send us pictures of your carvings, even if they're in process. We'd love to share them with everybody and see what you've created. Thanks, Leah. And as we mentioned, too, we have a learning lab that we will be sending out in our follow up email where we put together all of these resources. So there will be a place for the our examples and your artwork to live, as well as the PowerPoint and other links if you want to learn more. So we also always encourage you to think about, look around your house and see what other materials you could possibly use. You know, we mentioned modeling clay and soap. There's a lot of different artwork that has been carved and there's a lot of different materials that you could use. 